radio for the masses. Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. If the game is rigged, change the game. Game changer. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. This is Fade to Black with your host, Jimmy Church, on the Game Changer Radio Network. All right, good evening, Fade to Black. How you doing? How you doing? It is going to be one of those shows tonight. Today is Thursday, April 6th, 2023. I'm your host, Jimmy Church, and our guest tonight, all the way from the United Kingdom live, Michael Feely joins us. And tonight we're going to be discussing ancient symbols and codes, that and a whole lot more. Michael is a former UK police officer. There you go. And now an ancient code breaker, spiritual life coach who has authored seven paperback books. He's got many in the works right now. He's an international public speaker. He has recently filmed and also presented a documentary series called Higher Consciousness on Iconic TV. That's David Icke's channel. And he has also appeared in in an iconic film called A Divine Intervention, also featuring David and Eric Von Daniken. His link is below, michael-feely.com. We have it uh, below and, of course, over on the website and throughout social media. And I would like to welcome, for the first time, the fade to black, Michael Feely. Michael, good evening, young man. How you doing? A good evening. Thank you for the youngest, but... Uh been a long time since anyone said that so thank you <laughs> yeah, yeah right <laughs> and uh you know here's here's the thing you gotta love adjusting my camera just a little bit um you gotta love technology man you know the uk here real time blazing color great audio yeah you gotta love technology man and uh welcome to the show uh before we get started uh you get the first time guest disclaimer yeah, so let's get that out of the way. Michael, it's just you and I sitting on my couch having a conversation as friends. And where the conversation starts, it starts. Where it ends, it ends. But we're going to end as friends. There you go. All right. Do you accept? Absolutely. <laughs> it, uh, this is, uh, this uh, be, before we uh, get the balls rolling, because this is going to be a great conversation tonight. Uh, what part of the UK are you in right now? I'm just outside uh, a city called Birmingham, so it's pretty much in the centre of the UK, in the Midlands. Uh, so it's, it's England's second city, and as I say, it's right, pretty much in the centre of, of the country. And also the centre of the heavy metal universe. No, absolutely. It, it does have a lot of, you know, Ozzy Osbourne, it has uh, Judas <laughs> Priest, it has all of these different people that originate from from the same area so it's now, why, why, why do you um I've, I've asked all those guys uh this question right why birmingham the sex pistols right why what what's is it is it is it the uh middle class is it working class is it the, the all of the factories uh or is it the desire to get out of town so you want to get rich and maybe live somewhere else. I don't know what, what's 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 the reason for all the great music coming out of there. I guess so. I mean, Birmingham itself is, is really a very very working class city, and you know there's many many deprived areas of poverty and and, and different things. That there seems to be several epicenters of 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 interest in music. You obviously got London for obvious reasons. <clears throat> you have Birmingham. You have the likes of Liverpool with the Beatles and, and different things. So that there seems to be that they are the three major sort of epicenters of, of music. Uh, but yes, I, I guess it's some people sit there and think, I want something more, I want something better. And, it, and it's, those, it's those forward thinkers and visionaries that, that actually make the grade and, and get what they want. Yeah, I asked uh, Steve Jones one time of the Sex Pistols, right? We're sitting in his living room and... Uh, and I go, uh, so Steve, did you have any idea 
what you were about to do to the world. And he goes, you know what, man? We were trying to make enough money to drink and get out of this town, right? That's all we were focused on. We had no idea. And, and that's, that's, that's what great art is, right? You're, you're doing it for yourself, and whatever happens, happens after that. It does. You, you, you do it for the love of, of, you know, the labor of love. Because if, if you do stuff that you like, you never work a day in your life, do you? Because you, you know, everything you do is your passion. And, and I guess, yes, it, it, some, some people just want better. Some people want to get out. And the fortunate ones who do, you know, that they, they just seem to have a different way of, of, of viewing life, of viewing reality, of viewing things. And they're, they're the ones that have the vision and the motivation to, to, to make it and, and to do that. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, certainly Birmingham, that is, is, is a kind of city that, you know, you don't tend to move into. You, you, you're born there, really. And, 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 and move <laughs> yeah. that's, that's, oh, man. Tends to be what, what happens. That's a great answer. That's, that's, that's an honest answer. That's an honest answer. Um, uh, can I make one comment? You look like a cop. Yeah. <laughs> you look like a cop. And so that's a, is, is it a strange transition? I want to talk about you growing up, of course, but um, yeah. is that, is that a strange transition to go from uh, a peace officer, you know, law enforcement, and then into this, you know, ancient code breaking, or is that training that you take advantage of? Well, it turned out to be. I mean, um, when when you join uh, the police, certainly in the UK, it is. When I joined, it was a thirty-year career. Now it's been extended to thirty-five. But when I joined, it was a thirty-year career which you signed up for, <clears throat> and it's not the kind of occupation that you leave. So you you expect to be there for that thirty years. And I got to year seventeen, and there were so many, should we say, paranormal, supernatural things happening to me that my life was never, never the same again. It could never be. I was, I was not the same person. You know, it had really changed everything. But the kind of experience and the talents that it gave me was following evidence, learning mm -hmm. to investigate, learning to go where the evidence takes you because it doesn't lie. You know, it, it taught me to go to court, to speak to judges, to speak to juries, and speak in a succinct way because all they were interested in really is is the facts you know what did you see what did you hear what did you smell how far away were you did you did you see these things and they're not really interested in in anything outside of that of those parameters <clears throat> so my style of writing my style of speaking my style of presenting things tends to be to the point matter of fact because that's kind of what i had to do so, you know, 17 years of, of, of investigating crimes or different degrees of crimes from, you know, being the first at the scene of a homicide to, you know, just a shoplifter or a fraud or a burglary. You know, it can be a very, very varied occupation and you never know what your next call will be. And, and it teaches you a lot of things about humanity, about the way in which people react, the way in which people think. And as I said, the, the, the most important part for what I do now was following evidence and collating evidence and putting it together <clears throat> and presenting it in an evidential fashion. And that really is, is something that you can't buy. You know, you can't go to, a, to, to Walmart and, and, and buy this kind of experience. So how, how that transitions is now I look for evidence that have been, been left in codes and symbols and, and monuments and monoliths. And I look at the ancient world, which initially I, I saw as an, uh, sort of an individual entity. You know, if it was Babylon and Samaria or Egypt or S South America or Stonehenge, I saw them initially as, as different entities. And I soon realised that actually now the, they're all part of the same thing. It's the same core of knowledge that has been spread out to all parts of the world and not just this world, but also our planets of the solar system. And and that has just been expressed in a different way with a different God or a different icon or a different prophet. But the, the central core, they were all talking about the same thing. And it's, it's a result of being able to see and spot evidence that has enabled me to put 
together basically a blueprint of the ancient world and religions and all of these things. It's not expected that I was going to leave. I didn't expect myself to leave. It was a change of circumstances that to me, looking back, was certainly predestined. And no matter what I was doing at that particular time, you know, I could have been on vacation on, on planet Mars, but it, it would have happened anyway. You know, my, my awakening would have happened regardless of where I was or, or what I was doing. And there's a certain predetermination about what happened to me. So it, it is a transition that surprisingly was extremely easy. I just literally wrote out my resignation and resigned from the police. Was it, like, was, was, it like cutting, was it like cutting the cord? Did you feel free? I did. Certainly, certainly the, a year leading up to when I resigned and when I left, there was a lot of things that I was beginning to witness and be asked to do that firstly were morally wrong. Uh, and secondly, were minor criminality, really, in, in terms of what I was being asked to do, even though I was a law enforcer, I was being asked to break the law in, in certain respects. And I refused to do it. And I, and I took a personal stand and, and refused to do that. So that certainly the last 12 months of my career, I was beginning to feel very, very disillusioned, very disconnected with with the service and the occupation that I originally joined because I was being taken further and further away from what I'd actually joined and intended to do. Right. So, you know, it was, it was kind of doing that. And then, and then again, when, when all, all of a sudden on a daily basis or a nightly basis, there was these strange off worldly things happening to me at the same time as this disillusionment and disconnectedness, then something had to change because I could no longer bear to be in that environment. And there was certainly a, should we say, a forceful hand that was pushing me out, pushing me out, uh, because obviously the, there was a, a different path for for me now to take. Did you? Um, let's back up before the police, uh, before the UK Police Department. Um, growing up. Did you have any paranormal experiences, spiritual? Did you see a UFO? Were you interested in the subject? I was extremely interested in the subject. I can, I can remember back, you know, even at the age of six and seven, uh, having extremely deep adult conversations with myself about how the world doesn't make sense and how I felt like I was in the wrong place, like I'd been dropped off literally on the wrong planet, and, and this was the age of six and seven. I used to watch... Or did watch, you know, the 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 movie The Ten Commandments with Charlton Heston, <clears throat> and I'd be sitting there at that age thinking, can a man part a sea, part an ocean, you know? And and if so, how did it happen? How can it happen? And as I say, that this was at the age of six and seven, of having these adult conversations. I don't remember having experiences as such, other than feelings that I didn't belong and there was more to my being here than I knew <clears throat> and it, that and that that kind of feeling li stopped stayed with me until I was able to answer those feelings what what those feelings were and what they meant uh, while you were on the uh, police force uh, did you see a UFO Lots, yes, lots. Ah, now, okay. Now, now you've you've caught my attention. And now, I don't want to spend a lot of time here in this subject. Uh, we're we're going in other directions. But um, in your training as a police officer, everybody wants to know: um, Did you have uh, any conversations about response to a sighting? Is there a protocol in place in the UK for a UFO sighting and is a part of your training? It's not part of the training. It's certainly hushed up very quickly if uh, there is a sighting. There's, there's been many sightings that I've had, and, and just to give a few examples of them, I, I, I was on night duty with a colleague and we both saw a dimensional portal opening up in the sky and a UFO coming out of it. And then the portal closed up. I, I was I was at an incident once again on night duty where I'm absolutely convinced that there was a landing. 
because of what was happening in the area, the lights going off and, and people seeing silhouettes in their gardens and <clears throat> underground explosions of, 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 of electrical surges. And, and it was it was a weird, a weird night. And, and, and ironically, when I got back home off, off night duty, which finished at 7 a.m. in the morning, by 8 a.m. I was speaking to a local UFO group. And as I was emailing them this this incident, in front of my eyes, my emails were removed as if they were being copied and then they were put back. And from that point on, my cell phone was tapped. My landline was tapped. We had a, 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 a telephone engineer come out to the electricity box, that the phone uh, network box outside of our house. And he came and said, There's, I don't know what this is, but it shouldn't be there. There's some kind of anomaly inside the box that, that fed, you know, the network of, of landlines in my street. And so from that point on, I began to be uh, monitored. You know, there, there, was, there was instances where I was, again, looking at balls of fire in the sky and have taken pictures of that ball of fire which looked nothing like the naked eye what the naked eye saw a couple of weeks later in the same area my police force helicopter was just leaving an incident and all of a sudden it was being followed back to the airport by an orange ball of fire it was all recorded on you know on board cameras they were refused permission to land and all the incident logs were completely sealed blocked off no one could access it so there isn't necessarily a protocol other than to try and cover it up yeah there's uh, a part of, yeah there's a protocol for after the fact right yeah. yeah i mean when when you're talking about things coming into a certain airspace then there's certain authorities that are triggered you know the aviation authorities sometimes the military and, and so the, the response really is is to conceal everything as, as much as possible you know and sometimes you know I, I know people who are deeply into the ufo subject who are serving officers and they're really really ridiculed and really really should we say told in in you no know, uncertain terms you know you need to not be talking in this way uh because it's not compatible with your rank with your position so that they're, they're trying to stub it out really it's like that cigarette end you know that they try and stub out as quick as they can if there were to be an invasion, then you know that the, there's protocols for that kind of thing. But in terms of sightings, they like to keep you quiet, but they like to know what you've seen and what you've heard and what you're doing with the information. Did you, uh, mm -hmm. uh, with your partner again? I don't want. I, I could talk all night about your job and, and UFOs. It's a great subject, but I want to get to ancient codes and, and symbols. But let me ask you this. Um, your partner, you guys witnessed this, you said portal. I think you described it as, as a portal. Um, did, do you write that up? Did you write up a report? No. Uh, I've seen I've seen a number of portals. Uh, the, the only place that I wrote it up was I documented it and I later used it when I began to write books, which at the time I didn't realize I was going to be writing books because I was still serving in the force. So it was basically a conversation between two colleagues who'd witnessed it and it didn't go any further. If you imagine it was a, a beautiful night, starlit night, dark skies, no haze of, of street lighting or anything like that. <clears throat> and we look up in, into the sky and we see this like wormhole. It just appears and, and expands in the in the sky and all of a sudden this craft comes out of the end and the craft continues across the sky and we watch it across the sky and then after 20 30 40 seconds the wormhole just dissipates and disappears but the craft is still in the sky <clears throat> so pretty uh, there's there's been there's been incidents where i've not been at work but i've been with friends and we've been in dense dark forestry and all of a sudden we've had these this beautiful bright white light in the trees that were so bright that we couldn't see into the light you just couldn't look at it and when we've looked back at the photographs there's orbs and all kinds of things exiting and, and, and entering this portal and i've seen many many sort of localized portals very very small you know uh vortexes that i've seen many many times in in my house in other people's houses as well so there are these gateways that are 
doorways between dimensions and it, 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 it was really i say by chance you know I, I don't believe it was by chance but it would just happen to be a fluke that we we're driving in that particular direction at that particular time 60 or 70 seconds later we'd have had no knowledge of, of it ever happening is it is it you are you attracting this do you think it you've got something to do with this the amount of things that i was seeing and literally every day or every night something would be happening so i would see something occasionally by myself more often than not in the presence of others but it was every day or every night they're all seeing things so there has to be a connection between me and being a multiple experiencer and and one of the reasons that i was told was in order to speak about these things in order to be able to help people with these things you first of all had to experience these things and that is a large part of the reason that i became a multiple experiencer not only of ufos but other things as well mm -hmm. but i had to witness it in order to basically pass the messages on and speak about it with any any kind of certainty because i would seen it i've seen it there, there, there isn't many things in in a paranormal and supernatural arena that i haven't experienced in some way do you think that uh, this has been going on for thousands of years under different names you know different uh, uh explanations you know across cultures of course and across time uh, where you describe it today as a portal or something interdimensional. And in the past, it could be angels, demons, you know, ghosts, you know, spirits, what, uh, uh, flaming shields in the sky, right? However, these mm -hmm. things may be described, but it's all the same thing. And it, it has been going on for a very long time. It is, and, and what people are doing is, is they're using the language that, that they know and they speak, and, and sometimes that's pictorial, to express the same thing. And, you know, some, some may say crimson, some may say red, some may, may describe it as, a, as, a, as equals vision, you know, a wheels within wheels, but, but they're all speaking about the same thing in a different way. And, and, and if we were to now witness an, an, an event and we were asked to write about what we'd seen, then we would use different terminology to describe the same event. And that's what they were doing. And, and when you look at, you know, cave paintings that are thousands of years old, when you look at some of the secret rooms in the Great Pyramid that contain technology not of this world, they, they contain writings not of this world. I've dated the Great Pyramid at nearly 74,000 years of age. Now, it mentions visitors from other worlds then so that they've always been a part of this world and, and what we're doing we're making the mistake of looking in outer space when really it's all in inner space within our own consciousness within a different frequency band to what we operate within ordinarily and when we change our frequency and we we align ourselves to them or they align our, themselves to us then we begin to interact and that's what was happening with me the uh, the question of evidence comes up so often and and not only you would think you know just from the skeptics or the debunkers you know and and those that are going to call us crazy you know what evidence do you have so you have that but also inside of our community too we get excited right we get excited with evidence and we get so caught up in the fantastical side of it or the consciousness side of it that uh, finding evidence there is a difficult thing to do. You can witness, you can experience, but it's another thing to be somebody chasing the evidence. And that's what you're doing for this community. Is it because you need the evidence to back up your own your own opinions and theories and and maybe to prove to yourself you're not crazy right <laughs> to, to, to get to that as well yeah i, I mean my, my take on things is that many many testimonies testimonies in court 
the majority is eyewitness, eyewitness accounts. That's right. So an eyewitness is classed as a witness, you know, that they are a good witness. They saw it, they smelt it, they heard it. Now they had, they had something under observation for X amount of minutes. They are credible witnesses. So I was considered a, an expert eyewitness in any court in the UK because of the position that I held and the amount of years that I'd held that position. So when I see something, and I'm just saying, oh, look, it's a UFO. I go through a process of elimination of what it may be before I've ruled out everything that we know. Then I start saying, okay, well, I've ruled out everything in box A. Now what's in box B? What could it, what could it be? And I've always said, I can never say to you with, with, with any degree of certainty who is piloting these craft. What I can say is they exist. They are in our airspace day and night, and I've seen them many, many times. So I know for my own satisfaction that they are there. When you start saying to people, you know, this is what I saw, well, they either believe you or they don't. And that is the same in, in any discipline. It, it's, I, I don't feel the need to convince anybody of what I've seen. I will gladly share what I've seen. I will gladly give an explanation of what I've seen. And I'll gladly go into the details of why I've come to that conclusion. But I don't feel inclined or to, to convince someone this is what I've seen because I know I have. And what people believe and what people's viewpoint is, is their business, not mine. So if people ask me my opinions or my observations or my evidence or my research into things, then I'd gladly share that with them. But I don't feel any need to convince them of what I've seen. You know, I, I have sufficient evidence for me and the only person i can control in this world is me that's right that's right i have uh i have developed an attitude and it is i don't give a crap what you think right <laughs> that's my attitude yeah when you when you see something and and at night that's one thing but for me you know the holy grail stuff oh you're you're British. I just said Holy Grail, but I'm pump. But anyway, um, is is daytime when you see something in the day. Now you can see the shape, right? You can see structure. You can see other details that you're not going to get at night. And when you see that, and you know it's not a plane, train, automobile, rocket, meteor, satellite, whatever, all those human origin things, right? And you can check everything out, and it and it's not any of those. Now, I don't give a crap what you think. I know what I saw, and I don't need to convince you of that. It's, exactly. it's, I, I, just, I, I, I don't care. That's not why I'm here. I'm not here to change your mind. Right? And, 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 that, and that's exactly my take on it. You know, when I've, when I've been traveling through my hometown on a bright, sunny, blue sky Saturday afternoon, with lots of cars and lots of people, and I've looked into the sky, and I've seen three gigantic cigar-shaped UFOs in broad daylight hovering above my town. I don't need anybody else to convince me what I've seen and what I haven't because I have seen them. When I've been to, to an event and I've been with two people and all of us have stood next to someone not of this world in broad daylight in the middle of a public place and only the three of us could see the true appearance. <clears throat> you know, I've been literally 12 to 18 inches from what you would deem men in black. Mm -hmm. Black eyes, just just horrible. Uh, I don't I don't need to convince people of that because I know that I was in our presence and I, and I know it wasn't there. I wasn't the only one that saw this. And when you when you look at the skeptics and when you speak to the skeptics and they, and they say, oh, it's just, it's just your mind playing tricks on you. Well, what about the other several people who saw the same thing? You know, it, it, it is the same illusion being cast through their mind as well. You know, I, I sent a, a, a picture off once of, of, of a portal and, and, and I knew what they were going to come back with. So I just held back on, on, on a lot of the information and they came back saying it's camera trickery and this problem with the cameras and this, that and the other. And then I said, well, OK, well, how do you account for 
several people seeing it with our naked eye, taking a picture, which just verified what we saw with the naked eye, and they couldn't answer it. Well, here's but here's the thing. Anybody that is close-minded, anybody, doesn't matter who it is. It could be somebody that uh, is not a scientist, right? Is not really, you know, I'm not referring to that, but I, it's anybody that hasn't experienced anything yet, mm. right? That's, that's the key. You know, would um, somebody like uh, Sean Carroll, you know, the great physicist, he's amazing. Uh, I don't agree with half of his stuff, but he's a very smart guy. But he doesn't believe in ghosts or the paranormal or spirituality or consciousness and, and certainly uh, UFOs and things visiting. It's because he hasn't experienced it yet. He sees a ghost. I think that's going to change his mind, right? And I think, you know, and if you see something in the sky in broad daylight that is obviously not ours, that's going to change his mind. So those that do that, that put up the front, haven't experienced it yet. And now it's a paradigm shift when it happens. And eventually something will happen. But that's that's what we're dealing with here. They just haven't experienced what you have. Well, pe people can only see things from their level of consciousness or their level of reality at that time. Uh, but any 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 true scientist, you know, has to acknowledge that there is a divine force, a designer that has put all, all of these things into place. And any scientist that, that shuts that down is really not particularly a scientist because there's so much evidence now. There's so it's, it's so obvious that this is by design. This is by creation. You know, that we were told by science that it was the Big Bang that was the start of everything. But now they're starting to acknowledge that the Big Bang wasn't the start of everything. There was bits before that. When you look at the mathematical sequencing, when you look at the every sound has a shape, every shape is a sound. When you look at everything being a cycle, when you look at everything being a mathematical adherence, there has to be a programmer. When you look at the programming of our own DNA, the knowledge and the intelligence that is in pro programmed in our own DNA, it is a three billion letter language. That's not just come here by chance. And anybody who is a true scientist would want to look into that and explain and, and try to explain that. Where did the coding come from? Because, you know, we didn't write it. It's an advanced coding. There's so much evidence that scientists could follow, uh, but they don't. And, and, and it's, it's to their detriment, it really is, because they're not going to get as far and progress as far as they can and should when they shut down this obvious issue that we are all here by design, not by some random Big Bang that has put everything into place. That's nonsense. We're not here because of Darwinism. Because we've we've you know gone from monkeys into what we are now. That's yeah. nonsense. Yeah. It's absolute nonsense. You know, our DNA, our coding is programmed in the cosmos. It is programmed by design. Now what you have to look at and what you have to question is well, okay, if a painting appears, then there's been an artist. Who's the artist? And if you shut that down, you know, you're not gonna get and progress as far as you should no you've got to have you've got to open up your mind you have to you have to think outside of the box or you you don't go anywhere you just stay inside the box and yeah. and you don't progress um okay so you mentioned and i'm gonna drive this right there and we'll see how this comes out the other side you said i want to understand did you say that the great pyramid was possibly 74,000 years old? I, I've dated it at 73,440 years of age as of now. How? So by using Egyptian star codes, which were later taken by the Hebrews that they encrypted into their lunar calendar, which was then written into the Dead Sea Scrolls and was hidden in the Cumberland Caves, which are now, I've located at Rosalind Chapel in Scotland. 
so by looking at these star codes if you make when we just talked about science science is observation and taking data from that observation now the first thing that man ever observed were the stars so the original sacred science is star movement it's astrology it's astronomy and they knew with perfect precision what effect a certain star would have in a certain area so if you went to your your people as a pharaoh or a high priest and you said in july the waters of the nile will rise and you will have three months of crops and then the waters will recede and the crops will die for four months and then on such and such a day this will happen and then on such and such a day this will happen your people will turn around and say only gods can know that information so you must be a god when all, all you're doing really is is becoming a prophet by reading the celestial narrative so when you read the celestial narrative and i have and you look at the amount of layers of the great pyramid and you marry the two of them that's the date that it gives you and the sphinx is pretty much the same because the sphinx really represents man and, and man's uh, transit from animal and that's the body of the sphinx the bottom half of the sphinx is the animal man the top half of the sphinx is the god man and we make that transit through certain knowledges that have been encrypted in the likes of the great pyramid which is created by the creator so i've used those stars i've used the the the, the levels and the layers of the great pyramid and i've come up with the date as a result of those things who built it then the creator the creator and and the reason i come to that conclusion there, there were a race of beings who had elongated skulls who and then they found elongated skulls at many of these sacred sites from peru malta stonehenge egypt uh, all of these places the, the, this elongated skull race operated from the seventh sphere of consciousness which is really the god state so they were the hands on the ground so to speak but when you look at creation we have in the fourth dimension hyperspheres almost like toroids now when energy of the universe goes into the toroid and goes through the middle and is dragged down it creates the tetrahedron so the tetrahedron shape is the third dimension created from fourth dimensional spin which spins so fast it becomes hardened and that is the solidity of the third dimension so in the pyramid you have third dimensional creation which is the first manifestation of the divine in our dimension and that is replicated or symbolized and represented by the pyramid shape so the third dimension comes from fourth dimensional spin every dimension or every object has to have a dimension higher than the dimension of its shape so as an example i go out on a sunny day i'm a three-dimensional object i cast a two-dimensional shadow when people see three-dimensional shadow people and i've seen lots of them they are fourth dimensional objects casting a three-dimensional shadow that shadow has lost a dimension in its projection in the same vein that is a two-dimensional object that pen now, if it only existed in the t in the second dimension, I would only be able to move that pen in two dimensional directions. But now I'm moving that pen in three dimensional directions. So that means that that two dimensional object has a higher dimension surrounding it that it can fit into. And that is dimensions. So the fourth dimensional hypersphere spin creates the tetrahedron, the third dimensional manifestation. That is your pyramid. You also have the fabric of matter, which is the cube. Pyramids are cubic. If you take the top four corners off a cube, you get the tetrahedron. So now putting that into what I've just said, the pyramid represents the divinity within matter, the divine man, the God man. And if you have made the grade, then you are represented by the pyramid. And it was the creator in conjunction with this elongate, elongated skull race who were operating at the God consciousness 
who have created these monuments, not only on Earth, but on other planets, on Mars, on the Moon, on Saturn, on Venus, on Mercury, on the moons of Mars. There's all of these monuments that are in alignment with earthly monuments. When you look at the face on Mars, which mathematically is a perfect match to the face of the Sphinx of Egypt, but the face on Mars in its longitude and its latitude mathematical coordinates tells you how to find Stonehenge. The Great Pyramid in its longitude and latitude coordinates tells you how to find the five-sided pyramid on Sidonia. They are a satellite navigation system through mathematics. It is far, far wider than Earth, but these things are tools in order for us to expand and exist outside the third dimension. Now, before I went to Egypt last time, I'd booked the trip. Everything was in place. I'd booked, you know, internal flights to Cairo and different things when I got there. Now, 10 days before I went, I received a strange email out of the blue from a psychic medium in Scotland who I didn't know. And I've actually got the message up now, which I'll, which I'll read. She said, regarding your trip to Egypt, you need to look past the tourism, learn about her, understand her, and then teach about her. A messenger will find you. You will help uncover more insights and translate ancient knowledge brought to us from great distance. Under the Sphinx lies an ancient secret knowledge that will be added to your toolbox. She goes on to say, use this wisely for the benefit of all. All meaning past, present and future. It all belongs together in the same place. You must absorb, accept, understand and finally know. Only then can you share and teach. This was a, this just was a cryptic message that came out of the blue 10 days before I flew out to Egypt. And as a result of that trip to Egypt, when I got back from Egypt, you know, I was I was sitting in my living room one evening and a scattered beetle manifested itself out of the wall. In the same time period, I was walking through a street. And all of a sudden I heard a kind of whoosh sound and I felt like I was contained in, in some kind of bubble. But the streets were the same. The area where I was was the same. And then I looked to my left and there's an Egyptian pharaoh walking alongside me. And I, in, in a multidimensional view, I could see the pharaoh from the side. I could see him from the front and I could look through his eyes all at the same time. Who was he? I don't know because he was wearing a full face mask. Uh, later on, I went uh, to my parents' house and they said, oh, we'd, we'd, we'd clean up your old room. And we found basically this family tree, this family history that my uncle had done many, many years ago. And I read through it and I realised that I was, I was related by blood to Irish kings of, of Celtic Ireland. And then when I did my own research and looked into it, this particular line of kings came from Queen Scotia of Egypt. So my bloodline is Egyptian royalty, Egyptian pharaonic royalty. Did you feel, uh, let me stop you right there. Um, uh, I just got back from Egypt, as you know, and I'm going back in a, in a couple of months. Oh, by the way, um, hold on, let me not forget this. Right here. So I, I just write notes to myself because my brain is this big. I'm going to be in in England in a couple of months. So I'm going to be in London and Manchester. Okay. So it, it'd be cool. I'd, I'd like to let's uh, let's go out to dinner and knock back a pint or two uh, because I would love to have a conversation with you. Um, uh, not on the air where we can talk about the real stuff. So anyway, um, uh, back to Egypt. Did you find uh, that there were? I felt that I've, I've I've got a connection there, right? I've I've dreamt about it my whole life. There's I don't I don't think about China. I don't think about Japan. I don't think about Russia. I don't think about Germany or or it, it, no. I I don't. I just don't. 
Egypt, I, I dream about and think about all the time. Yeah. So I knew that I was going to have some spiritual things go down there. Did you find that happening to you too in an unexpected way when you, you know, boom, and then something yeah. goes off? When, basically, when I was deciding where to go on vacation, uh, Egypt was, it was a real strong gut feeling. But in the same vein, I had a straight, the same strong gut feeling that it was more than just a vacation. There was something going on. There was a reason that I needed to be there at this particular time. So, yes, there was going to be the tourist vacation side, but there was something much deeper. Now, like you, I've always had a, a deep, deep interest in Egypt. I've always had a deep, deep interest in Christianity. I've always had a deep, deep interest in, in when I go walk past a church or a cathedral, I have to go inside. Not because I'm religious, but because there's a secret language that, that's speaking to me. And I have to go inside and communicate. So I've always had this innate need to be in that kind of area. So yes, I, I did. I did feel that there was something more going on. I did feel the presence of many things. I did feel, should we say, spiritual guardians who were guarding certain artifacts and certain corridors and certain places were certainly watching me every move that I that I made, everything that I did. Uh, in terms of when you come to Manchester, I know the perfect place, but we'll we'll sort that out. Off air. I can't. I can't wait. Uh, I, I know the perfect place for that. Uh, but yes, the, the, there's always something, or, or often something greater going on. You know, you, you can't always see the, the moves being made. You can feel them. You can't always see them. You can you can sense them, and you always you always have that. There's something more going on. I don't know what it is yet, but there's something more going on. Did you, have a, did you have a specific uh, uh, when when you think of Egypt? Because I can I can tell you right now, mm. instantly I had two different spots. I, I had things all. Do you have one thing that comes to mind first that was very special, a location? The things that, the, the things that were special for me, ironically, when, when I first saw the pyramid, I expected to be in awe of the pyramids and I expected to, to have a certain reaction. And I didn't have that reaction. It was, it was, <laughs> it, it's, it's like, so what? I've been here before. But yeah. What's the deal? You know, and, and it, that, that's... That was the overlying feeling of seeing the pyramids. It, it, it was now different to walking into my own apartment. It, it really wasn't. And but but the things that, that that keep coming back to me is times when I was there, and I will sometimes just have visions of me walking through the temples, through through the through the concrete floors of the temples, and seeing my feet, you know, carrying the light through my feet, walking and hearing the steps. And remembering, looking up and, and seeing things who have just appeared. And how I, how, I, how I would describe that is you're standing in a hotel. You're waiting for the elevator. The elevator comes to your floor. The doors open up. The people inside saying, I do apologize. We're on the wrong floor. Click on the button. The doors close and the elevator leaves. I saw this, but it was through frequency, not an elevator. And people appearing in temples who were who weren't there and then they appeared and i said to them are you in the wrong frequency and they said yes readjusted the frequency and they disappeared so the, these are the kind of special memories that that are forever coming to me and and the, the more than just trickery of the mind you can feel them you can sense them you know that it was you who've been there it, and, and the certain initiations the certain memories of initiations that i remember you know the, the certain but when i look at a symbol or something like that i, I have a, a recognition of it without having seen it before i just know what it is so yes you know it, it's a very very pinnacle epicenter of of worldly wisdom you know and and it it, it leaves us many many clues many breadcrumbs how to ascend how to make that transition as the Sphinx illustrates from the beast man to the God man to overcome our animalistic nature through knowledge, through wisdom. And part of that knowledge and that wisdom is encrypted within hieroglyphs, within cuneiforms, within ciphers, within codes, within symbols. And if you are able to speak those languages, then your world 
looks completely different. If I go to the airport now and I fly to Japan or China or anywhere and I'm walking through the streets of Tokyo, I have no clue as to what people are saying because I don't speak their language. I can't communicate with them. I can't engage in them because I don't speak their language. And that is the same with the, with the language of codes and symbols. If you do not speak the language of codes and symbols, you will not understand the true meanings of the Bible, which incidentally, the original Bible is the Giza platter, but you will not understand these holy writings. You will not understand these holy monuments and monoliths if you do not understand the language of codes and symbols. The, um, the two special places for me, uh, or three, uh, Temple of Isis, Dendera, and Abydos. Those those three places messed with me. Um, the but very very powerful stuff went down at those three sites, and it, it's very difficult to put into words. Um, and and for you, is there is there a temple uh, there that uh, speaks to you in that way? The Great Pyramid. When, when 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 people have the kind of reaction, the kind of feeling that you've had or people are really, really drawn to a certain place. That's because they've been initiated there at some point. Right. So you you are basically having that soul memory, that, that true essence meaning. You know, some people say, I have to go to Glastonbury, I've just got to go. Some people say, I've just got to go to Stonehenge, I've just have got this feeling. Some people say, I've got to go to the Great Pyramid or the Sphinx, because that's where they were initiated in a previous incarnation. And they're having that memory and that urge to continue where they left off. So if you've reacted in the way in which you've reacted, you have some kind of special initiation connection to those places. Dendera brought me to tears. Mm. I mean, it was just crazy. It was powerful. And there, there were, uh, uh, I wasn't the only one that day. I mean, there were people being dragged out of that temple, <laughs> just, you know, losing it. Mm. And, and we were there to support each other. But uh, it, it got to the point where I was like, man, you know, this is this is strong. Now, I want to go back. Uh, 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 we, uh, you mentioned elongated skulls in, in Egypt. And if you look closely um, at different temples and you have to have the good eye, you can see it. Um, it's there. Um, and then, of course, Akhenaten and his family. Um, and the way that he is, or she, I'm not sure if even he is a he, or if he's even human for that matter. <laughs> There's some questions there too as well. Um, but uh, do you think Akhenaten did have an ET alien uh, DNA string there? Why the exotic look in his representation, not only on, on temple walls, uh, but in sculpture, uh, too, as well, he was uh, very, or she, or it, uh, was very dramatic looking. Uh, what do you think was ultimately going on there? There's there's many things going on with, with any uh, statue, any sculpture, any building, any picture, that when you look at something that looks androgynous, you're basically looking into the time before separation. So when you look at the towers around the world, it, it, it represents the number one, the time before separation. Mm. And that separation is duality. So the androgyny, the same with the likes of the Mount Elise, the different things, the androgyny is the time before separation. There's so many different facets of meaning to these statues, that where they're pointing, the things they're holding in their hand, the way their knees are bent or their arms are bent, the, the, where they're looking, you know, it, it's it's... The, the size of them, the dimensions of them, all of these different things give you the true meaning of them. So, you know, they, they used to do their, their eyes with the black makeup to, to make themselves look like the serpent. The serpent, of course, is wisdom. You know, and anybody, when, you, when people are depicted as snake men or serpent men, then that it, it illustrates and symbolizes and represents that they've awakened the serpent within them, which in many cultures is known as Kundalini energy. And they wanted to replicate that. You know, when you, when you look at the likes of the, of the cobra and the vulture, well, that is the beginning and the end of the Egyptian alphabet. 
So in other words, it's the equivalent of the alpha and omega. So we're talking about the, the cycle of rebirth well, when we look at these kind of things. When you have your left leg forward, you know, you are talking about the heart, the left-hand path, which is the feminine path, which is what we know as today as sin, because the road to Damascus basically means the left or the right-hand path. So the left-hand path is the feminine, the right-hand path is the masculine, the moon and the sun. The word sin is the moon, which gives us the word sinister, which originally meant lunar wisdom. So a male-dominated society and a male-dominated church needed to eradicate the feminine, the goddess. So he brought in the Christ, the sun, the masculine, to dislodge the feminine. Therefore, we eradicated sin. So there's so many different facets of meaning. And it's not just one meaning that they are encrypting and encoding within these statues and these monuments. You have to look at every part of it. You have to look at everything as a whole, not as a, as a singular. You know, you have to look at how many people are in the line, where they're facing, where their legs are facing, what they're looking at. That gives you the true story. And in the same way, when I was looking at individual civilizations as individual entities, as I've mentioned previously, it's not until you see them as all in union do you get the full picture. If you look at one statue in isolation, if you look at one civilization in isolation, you are not getting the full picture. When uh, we're going to take a break and I'm going to set up, for, uh, we're going to get deep into codes and symbols, ancient codes and symbols, uh, when we come back after the break. You had said earlier that the Giza Plateau represents or is the Bible. That's the origins of the Bible. Uh, that's what we're going to discuss when we come back. But can you expand on that statement? Because that's uh, that's strong. That's bold. Yeah. Egypt is the original Bible in stone. It is the oracle in stone. The, the first stone that would have been laid on the Great Pyramid is the cornerstone, which is always northeast. And that is the cornerstone that the builders rejected. We have the word Christ encrypted within the mathematics of the Great Pyramid. We have the words Lord Jesus Christ encrypted within the mathematics of the Sphinx. We have New Jerusalem encrypted within the mathematics of the Sphinx. So we have all of these things. We have Noah's Ark. The Dead Sea Scroll tells us that Noah's Ark is the Great Pyramid. And we have all of these different facet parts that, that tell us that Egypt is the true uh, Christ. It is Osiris is Christ and Osiris is a metaphor for the pineal gland. So it, it's, it, you can take the Giza Plateau, which was then corrupted by the Hebrews, which then became Christianity, what we know as Christianity. And Christianity is not what you think it is. And that will be a good place to, to continue. In a yeah, moment. Let's, uh, whoo, okay, let's take our break right here. I guess tonight, Michael Feely, live from the UK. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. And you can already tell that uh, we are about to go deep. And we're going to do all of that when we come back after this quick break. This is Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Stay with us. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black. Please visit all of our sponsors. We're taking a quick break here. All of the links are below. And we'll be right back. This is Jimmy Church, and I want to introduce you to Life Waves X39 Stem Cell Activation Patch, which has totally transformed my health, my sleep, brain, and my eyes. I no longer need reading glasses. X39 is a true breakthrough in regenerative science. Using light, X39's patented age reversal technology is clinically proven to signal the activation of younger stem cells, accelerating the body's natural healing process. X39 promotes restoration and rejuvenation, bringing the life-changing benefits that I've experienced. By naturally elevating a master signaling peptide in the body, X39 boosts vitality, health and wellness, and resets 4,000 genes to a younger, healthier state. It's one patch, once a day, and you can turn back time with X39. Just go to HealingWorksNow.com. That's works with an X. HealingWorksNow.com. Hey, everybody. It's Billy Carson, also known as Forbidden Knowledge. 
I want to talk to you about a very special event coming up July 30th, 2023, the Forbidden Conscious Awards. We're going to honor people who have been contributing to the conscious community for decades. People that you know and love that have helped you get to higher levels of thought and consciousness and awareness. It's going to be a live in-person event, but seats are going to sell out very fast. You want to make sure you're there in person. And guess what? You can help vote for the winners. Voting is available on ForbiddenKnowledge.com. And the categories are going to be social media influencer, podcast slash radio host, TV host, actor, director, producer, entrepreneurs, health and wellness, philanthropists, authors, field researchers, archaeologists, space anomaly hunters, and of course, a Lifetime Achievement Award. I'll be your key note speaker that night at the Forbidden Conscious Awards. We have celebrity guests performing. We'll have a halftime show where we're actually going to perform music for you. And don't forget about the pre-event mixer where if you buy a box seat, you'll be in the VIP section and you also have private access to a VIP mixer with celebrity guests. Shake hands, break bread, network, and then walk the red carpet with us and take amazing photos. It's going to be a night to remember. You don't want to forget this. Make sure you hurry up and get your tickets because they're selling out very fast. I want to see you there for Bid and Conscious Awards 2023. April 7th through the 14th, 2023, I'll be hosting and presenting on the Hidden Secrets Seminar at Sea Cruise. From Los Angeles to the Mexican Riviera on the Navigator of the Seas. That's right, up top, a giant water slide. You've got to check out the Navigator of the Seas. It's amazing. We've got Scott Walter, Adam Apollo, Nick Pope, Brad Olson, Vivian Chauvet, Jason Shirka, Robert Grant, Ruben Langdon, and another 12 amazing speakers and presenters. It's all simple to do. Just visit divinetravels.com forward slash hidden secrets 2023. You know you want to go on a cruise with me. River Moon Coffee, makers of the Fade to Black Blend. Truly the best coffee on planet Earth. Just visit rivermoonwellness.com or, or their Amazon store. It's all simple to do. You can check out the Fade to Black Blend, the Game Changer Blend, or any of their Black Moon Wellness products. It's the only coffee I drink. It is the best, and it's Doc. Again, rivermoonwellness.com You're on mood, Jimmy, say. So. <clears throat> now i'm unmuted and uh everything that i just said was the most profound things i've ever said in my life but i'm not going to repeat them so you're going to have to <laughs> go back and listen. um here here's the thing when uh i was at the mina house Right at right there, you know, at the at, in front of the Great Pyramid, having having dinner one night, uh, just arrived there, and I said I was with a group of friends, and I said right there, Moses walked on that sand. Right, <laughs> I mean, it's just crazy, the history and the age of everything that is there. Um, now to uh, to decode. Uh, the Giza Plateau into these kinds of statements that we're making now. Where did you start? You have to start somewhere. Yes, I, I mean, basically Moses didn't walk there. Uh, the these biblical characters are metaphors for for something deeper. Mo Moses is a title given to an initiate, and Moses being born in Egypt comes from. The name Egypt, which is really Kemet, and the letter M in Kemet is Mem, which is water, and Moses means drawn from the water. So the letter M of Kemet is Moses, and that is how Moses is born in Egypt. <clears throat> All of these biblical characters are, as I say, metaphors for a greater consciousness, a greater awareness, and how to attain that Godhead status. But I, I, I became very, very interested in the same questions as everybody else has you know what are these things what do they represent what do they mean <clears throat> and brick by brick I, I just began to to piece it all together 
and make the connections between all the different seemingly individual civilizations who were talking about the, the exact same things but by different ways so I, I basically just started from a passion from an interest and an inquisitive mind as to what how and who if we uh, certain things have been mentioned tonight and really caught my attention uh, first off the pyramid being seventy four thousand years old when you see the great pyramid if we've all seen it in pictures right we've seen it in movies we have a certain idea there but when you see it in person it doesn't fit it simply doesn't fit it it you can look around it, and even though 5000 years old is really old it 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 it's older than that you can tell you can feel it you can see it um, but when you see the bent pyramid or the red pyramid or uh, the step pyramid, those don't have the age vibe that the Great Pyramid does. It's got a different thing, and, and that includes the, the, the Great Sphinx as well. D were all of these built, uh, my, yeah, obviously much earlier, but were the other pyramids built to try to copy the Great Pyramid? They had different different purposes. A, a lot of it a lot of it was to do with the sanctity and the harmony of sound. And all of these these buildings, these spiritually designed buildings are amongst other things, sound chambers. Now when you start looking at you know, bent pyramids and, and pyramids with steps and indentations, they were, they were built that way because that changes the sound. And as I said, you know, in the beginning was the word. The word is sound. And if Einstein had, had actually given us the full equation instead of half of an equation, then physics would have looked differently. It would have corresponded to vectors and sound waves and creation because everything is sound. <clears throat> Knowing when they knew that, they could create certain harmonics of sanctity using certain geometric shapes, using certain building shapes to harness, emit, and transmit a certain frequency of desire. When you look at the altar stone of Stonehenge, incidentally, I've been to Stonehenge and we've made the stones sing through sound. <clears throat> but you look at the altar stone and it is off center. You look at the, the King's Chamber of the Great Pyramid, it is off center and it is off center because it is where this, a certain sound octave that they needed for initiations was located in that building. So a lot of it, every stone, everything is a different octave, is a different sound, is a different chord. When I did a mathematical equation for the speed of reality, there was this extremely long number, a 14 digit number that came up in my equation. A couple of weeks later, when I was looking into the harmonics of the Great Pyramid, the exact same 14 digit number came up in the chord F inside the Great Pyramid. Hmm. How did that happen? You know, I'm, I'm doing a mathematical equation for the speed of reality and the exact same 14 digit number in the exact same sequence comes up in the harmonics of the Great Pyramid. It is a trans-dimensional portal, but it, it is all sound, it is frequency. Billy Carson, um... Uh, we didn't get a chance to go inside the step pyramid. It was closed. Okay. Otherwise we would have uh, gone in there and attempted to get lost. Right. That was my goal. But, but anyway, what is there? It's like five kilometers of tunnels, right? It's like an insane amount of uh, tunnels there, but he says, and I've never heard another researcher speak as directly about this as Billy. He says the chamber on the second level of inside of the Bent Pyramid is completely designed for sound, for healing the human body. Yes. Um, but do you agree with that? Yes. When, when again, when you look at the altar stone, if, if you look at something called the Was Scepter, which is spelled W-A-S, which you will only see high priests and pharaohs carrying, at the bottom of the Was Scepter, there is something that looks remarkably like a tuning fork. Now, 
it was only the masters of sound that were were allowed to carry these things. Now, the same in, in the in the pyramids as well. But if you the candidate used to lie on the altar stone, and the high priest, the master of sound, would hit the stone, and it would create reverberation sound all the way across the body from toe to head that balanced the frequency and the harmonies of the body in between the stones of stonehenge it is set at 111 hertz which is the frequency of healing so if, if you imagine what what is illness it is a frequency every part of our body has a sound a frequency that it should maintain in order to be of optimum health now if you have a particular organ or a particular part of your body that begins to reduce in its optimal frequency that will manifest as physical disease if you bring through harmonics through sound that body back into frequency alignment you will have good health so absolutely they were used for healing they were used for portal travel you know the, the chord f sharp which incidentally you know is 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 the, is the is the chord that pleased the lord it's f sharp which creates portals but everything is a harmonic you know every, everything is a transmitter and receiver of sound and depending upon what sound you reach depends upon what level of creation you align yourself to and when you start looking at mid-air acoustics three-dimensional mid-air acoustics which is basically levitation through sound and when you start looking at how were these rocks precisely cut through sound because when you get to a certain octave of sound it creates laser beams and that's how they're able to cut these stones with such precision when you look at the word stone in hebrew the word stone means father and son now when you analyze the word son you get sonic you get sound you get resonance these were created by sound for sound and with sound as i say you can travel dimensions you can travel the stars you can heal and balance the body in the um uh serapium 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 uh however you want to uh pronounce it those um those boxes i don't know what they're for i don't but they're not for what we're told. I, I, I think that's clear. They put bulls in there and worship. No, stop. It, no, no. And uh, but the size of those boxes, and they are ginormous. Where you can stand next to it, and the lid is above your head, and the lid is three feet thick. And you're looking at this 10 foot by 20 foot box made out of black granite. It's just crazy, right? It just boggles the mind. Um, but how they were put in there, I don't know. And how those lids were put on top and opened and closed, I don't know. But it seems like sound and frequency come into play there. Am I wrong? No. How they how they put the lid on top was by sound. In the same vein, if you go to the top of the Great Pyramid and you face south sided, there is there is a place that when you say the correct word in the correct frequency at the correct time, which has to be a time that contains seven or a number divisible by seven, there is a there is a rock that slides open seven feet. You then walk nine hundred and eighty feet down into the ground which just to give somebody a, a reference point that's almost the height of the eiffel tower down there are many rooms inside the great pyramid that appear not to be rooms because they're sealed but again if you know the correct word and you speak it at the correct frequency at the correct time it slides open it is sound and that's how they were putting the lids on that's how they put the, the you know the 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 stones at stonehenge how, how they move things how they're able to to use things if you imagine that the biblical ark of the covenant is the sarcophagus of the king's chamber but there were many mobile ark of the covenants which is basically again a transmitter and receiver of frequency 
that only people who had been initiated, and by initiated I mean expanded their own vessel sufficiently in order to take undiluted divine frequency, anybody else would perish in their presence. And that is really when you look at uh, Steven Spielberg's Raiders of the Lost Ark, and at the end they've got the Ark of the Covenant and all the German army are being killed. Well, that is basically telling you that the ones being killed are the uninitiated in the presence of this high frequency machine, this granite machine. But they used to have mobile Ark of the Covenants and they used to have a small Ark of the Covenants. Again, a transmitter and receiver of frequency. The Egyptian Ankh, you will see it in many pictures, the Ankh being pointed towards the nostrils because the nostrils is the gateway to the pineal gland of enlightenment and the Ankh the base of the ank and the top of the ank has polarized frequency and it accesses through the nose now when you start looking at the holy spirit biblically spirit means breath now the word jesus means divine breath the word christ means grain so that then comes into the last supper but 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 keeping with jesus and divine breath even the word yahweh y-h-w-h means to inhale and exhale, give and you shall receive. So you have the breath of life, the Holy Spirit, breathed into the nostrils, the connection between man and God. Now you have the Sphinx that has no nose. What is that telling you? That we have disconnected from the Holy Spirit. We have disconnected as a race from God. And when we return the Christ, which is divine circulation of breath, then we will be the Godhead once again. It is, the, the, there's so many intricate parts of, of, of wisdom that's put into these things. The, um, let me ask you this, uh, because we're going to circle back. Oh, okay, no. Oh, man, I've got to take, you're making me think, you're making me work uh, tonight. Okay, hold on, we're going to circle back to god we're going to come back to that um the <laughs> the purpose of the great pyramid uh one of the things that i enjoy pointing out is uh uh, uh james spader in in stargate in in the beginning of the movie he's giving a presentation and it's like at the met in new york right he's at the metropolitan museum of or, or a museum like that natural history or something he's giving a presentation about ancient languages and and the great pyramid and somebody raises their hand and says okay but who built the great pyramid and he goes i don't know and everybody gets up and walks out of the room Right. It's it's like the fundamental question that we all want the answer to. Right. We we all want to go there. For me, it's not necessarily who built it, but what was its purpose? What's the purpose? And we've got all kinds of theories out there. Uh, the Egyptians didn't write it down, right? We don't have an instruction manual for it. But what was the purpose? I understand frequency. I understand resonance. You can hear it all over. You can hear it echo. I've people ohming in there and frequencies, and we need to circle back to 432 hertz too as well. But what was the purpose of the Great Pyramid? There's, there's never just one singular purpose. On, on, on the first hand, it is basically a silent witness. It is a capsule of knowledge that where the laws of astronomy, the laws of nature, the laws of man, the laws of God, all of these things are encrypted in the stones. When, when you look at some of the stones, at the, the top of the stones of the Great Pyramid, they are inscribed, and they are inscribed by the elongated, elongated school people who put them there. So on, on the one hand, you have this magnificent sound machine that is harnessing liquid light, as a fuel for portals, which is ironically sometimes the same fuel that is used in craft to get them here. That is liquid light, that is volcanic lava, which you get when you go the 980 feet down in, into the ground. <clears throat> you have this wonderful machine that is really the conductor of the orchestra. 
and by that I mean if you take all of the other sacred monoliths and monuments of the world I see them as different sections of an orchestra so for argument's sake you'll have Stonehenge which is the woodwind you know you'll have to you Hanakan that is the brass section <clears throat> you have the great pyramid which is the conductor when they all come into alignment they all sing in harmony and your great pyramid is the conductor of that harmony of that orchestra so you have this wonderful system of, of magnetic energy and tectonic plate energy that are marked in certain places by spiritually designed buildings and that is what you have in your great pyramids and your stone hinges and different things but when they all come together they basically sing and it is that harmony that reconnects to to the great sound which is the universe when you look at other again looking at other things it, it, it represents divine man you know the man who has worked on himself who has rebirthed himself who has resurrected himself because again the word christ is written in the great pyramid by its mathematics anybody who has realigned themselves to their christ which was never an individual man he was just made to look that way by early christian writers who are trying to fill you but anybody who has unified themselves with their inner christ are called christians and those christified beings or in egypt he was asarified asaris five beings wore a cross as a badge of honor so to be christian is someone who is christified who is unified all aspects of themselves to become the god man that is what it is really to be a christian not just going to sunday service once a week and pretending so, the, so you have divine man as a symbol you have the number nine which is talking about the completion from the lower worlds to get back to the higher worlds you have again this wonderful system of music amplification of music these portals th th this conductor of the orchestra and it really is a, a, a wonderful silent witness in the time capsule of knowledge. Now, when I got a picture of a human head and I put it as an overlay on the Great Pyramid, I noticed that where the Queen's Chamber is situated is where the pituitary gland is in the brain. And where the King's Chamber is situated is where the pineal gland is situated in the brain. It is talking about the seat of consciousness. The mind of man that connects to the mind of god our father who art in heaven the universal knowledge and when you start looking at isis and what isis is isis the letter i is 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 really yourself and your other self and when you unify in a mystical marriage yourself and your other self you become the asarified or the christified being the christ so ultimately then okay so if we assemble all of that and i understand it then it's a communication tool ultimately yes it is because you can it's not a theory it's been done you 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 can put information words letters and sentences in sound waves when you look at the great composer Mozart, he used to put messages within the sound waves of his symphonies. So he'd send messages to his families by sound. You know, he'd replace musical notes with letters. It, it would become a cryptid cipher. You know, when you all of these th these different ways to transmit secret information. When you look at crop circles which are really sound but within crop circles you have what is known as diatonic ratios which is basically sound but within that sound you have letters and words and sentences and if you're able to extract them then it's a language hidden within sound the okay Man, I need to get back to God. We need to circle this back to God. And we will. 
but 432 uh, hertz, which is eight semitones down from 440 A, um, is a smoother frequency that is non-offensive. You would think that 440 is fine. We have been tuning to it for a, a very long time. I have a lot of guitars. I experiment with 432 and 440, but I also go off of that too as well. Plus, I'm playing with other musicians that tune um, uh, their instruments uh, up or down, half steps, whole steps, and, and things like that. Okay, so that being said, when you mention F sharp, is it the frequency of F sharp that is tuned to 440, A440, because F sharp is also, uh, look, let me explain something to everybody. All right. Uh, this is F, okay? This is F sharp. This is G. Okay, but that's the position on the neck. So if I'm playing to F sharp, my guitar could be up or down a little bit and not be playing a true F sharp. When you say um, F sharp, are you talking about the F sharp that is relative to a 440? Because it's going to resonate uh, w with with the stones and the megaliths a, di a different way if it's off just a little bit. So when you say that, what are you referring to? Is it A440? I'm referring to the 432 harmonics of the universe. Oh, because so we, we, we are talking about 432 then. Okay. We are. When, 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 we, when, we look at, when we look at 432, there is a hidden presence that is unseen, mm -hmm. which is the number nine. Number nine is, is significant. In, in terms of completion, in terms of higher dimensional frequency. So 432 hides the number nine, as well as many self Agio scale numbers, three, six or nine, and then you get into Nikola Tesla. But 432 is hiding the number nine. F sharp at that frequency opens portals. Okay, got you, got you. I, I, I tend to agree with that. When, All right. again, when you hit a certain harmonic, things happen if it is the right harmonic. When you when you talk about the biblical sixty four keys of Enoch, well, they're actually harmonic keys, and the Giza plateau is on an eight by eight grid. Eight times eight is sixty four, so they are the sixty four keys of Enoch. And when you hit the right tones, then you begin to open the stargate through sound, through harmonics. There's, 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 clearly, there's, there's different harmonics, the different tunings, the different frequencies. But anything that is universally harmonic and sound to the body is the ones that they were using. The, the Egyptian instruments, like the Sistra, were tuned to 432. When you look at the likes of Rosalind Chapel, it is set at the gestation temperature of a beehive which is also aligned to 432 as a hertz. So this is the frequency that they were using. So A would be A432 instead of A440, which you know we kind of use now. So they were using 432 as a harmonic. When, when Again, when we went to Stonehenge, <clears throat> and we were in the center of Stonehenge and, and the group of us, my co-host went into a trance she walked further into the center of Stonehenge and there's all of these tonal harmonics coming from her voice. And she said she felt like she was dematerializing. She had to touch something solid to bring herself back. She was going somewhere. She was disappearing. But whatever pitch, whatever harmonics were coming out of her voice, the whole of Stonehenge, the circles were ringing, literally. Now in August, 1971, there were five men in the centre of Stonehenge. They had a, a camp site, tents, and they had a fire that was burning in the centre of Stonehenge. Police were called because they were making a noise. And as the police officer and the farmer who called them were walking towards Stonehenge, they saw a flash of light, they heard a scream, 
and the five men had disappeared, never to be seen again. Yet their tents were still there, and their campfire was still burning. If you hit a certain frequency, you go somewhere else. And when you look at where have all of these ancient civilizations gone, they've dematerialized into the spaces between worlds to different places. But after the last initiation of the Great Pyramid, they have sealed it. And that's why you see these large stones wedged in the shafts. They have insulated themselves. They have sealed this technology and this knowledge and they have dematerialized themselves. That is why ancient civilizations have apparently just disappeared from the face of the earth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The uh, What do you make of the two chambers that have recently been found through Muon technology? What, what's going on there? And it, 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 there's obviously much more to be found. We just haven't found it yet. The, the one that I was that I was uh, looking at the other day was was one which is close to the entrance of the Great Pyramid. Now, when when you start looking at the entrance of the Great Pyramid, you have a double chevron above the entrance. Yep. Now, the double yep. chevron basically means where the two worlds meet. What you have in in ancient symbology is very much the womb, because we can only come into this world through the womb. Then you have the cosmic womb, which is the creator. Everything comes through the cosmic womb into the womb of the feminine, the physical. And you have the likes of the Milky Way, which is which is reconstructed in, in the Nile. You have the likes of the Hafa cults, which is really the, the milk of the cow. When you look at the word galaxy or galactic, the word gala means milk, mother's milk. So we are reconstructing the cosmic womb in the female womb, which we have to come through. Now, these were symbolized and represented in burial tombs, you know, the, the, the mounds and different things. And how they saw this is when you pass away and now, now these caves and, and, and entrances usually face where the sun sets. The Great Pyramid faces north, which relates to the womb. And that's why the Great Pyramid faces north, because it is the womb. Now, when people pass away, they go back to the womb sometimes symbolized by a grave, but they go through the womb when the sun is setting. They are dying. They then, the soul has to navigate itself through the labyrinth, which is the stomach, the belly. And that is why you have the heads of Easter Island pointing towards their navel, because they're pointing towards the womb. Now this labyrinth is reconstructed in the likes of your Stonehenge. But the soul navigates that labyrinth. And once it's navigated it, it rises with the sun to live again, a reborn, a resurrection, the resurrection of self. So these tunnels that are by the entrance of the Great Pyramid and other tunnels that will be found represent this process of the labyrinth from death to rebirth and you rebirth with the rising sun the horus into a new day into a day of light into a day of illumination and that is what they are representing the pit the underground the afterlife and that is what they are reconstructing this passage of the soul as it re-emerges into the light what, what do you make of man that's interesting oh man Oh, I've got to be up so early in the morning and I'm going to be up thinking about this all night. What about, um, and we're going to get back to God. Okay. I'm not going to let that go. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, the subterranean chamber at, at the, uh, in the great pyramid is the one thing that doesn't make sense to me. Um, I feel that I don't know. I don't think anybody does yet, but that's why I'm asking you. Um, that it was already there. You know what I mean? I think it was already there and they built a great pyramid on top of it. It was already a sacred site. And there was something else going on there. It doesn't make any sense. It's position. Uh, what is the sub, you know, what, what is it, what is it there for? And do you believe that it was there before the great pyramid was built? Now, the, the subterranean 
section represents the subconscious mind and the pyramid itself one of its representations is the conscious mind and we pass information from the subconscious mind to the conscious mind and again going into the pineal and pituitary the king's chamber the queen's chamber that is the conscious mind mm -hmm. the subconscious mind which is pretty much 95 percent of thoughts and anything else is the subterranean chambers all represented by the subterranean chambers which passes the information to the conscious mind when you look at the likes of tough tough is fought and when you see him on, on the boat with the baboon the baboon when you actually dissect the brain is the olfactory tract which deals with the nervous system so it, it, it's it's the mind now when you look at the mount of olives the biblical mount of olives it says that the mount of olives will be split in two east and west now when you look at the brain stem of the brain which is the olivary system of the brain it is split into two one is on the east one is on the west when you talk about lebanon that it's talking about the white matter of the brain so they are in the, in their own sort of say coded way they're talking about the mind because we have the mind of the human and we have the mind of the father the universal consciousness and we are striving to connect and raise ourselves to connect to the father in the heavens the universal mind the universal consciousness so your subterranean chambers are your subconscious mind and your pyramid one of its representations is the conscious mind the entrance facing north is very interesting uh, i'm talking about the great pyramid and uh, because of the east-west orientation of of the sphinx and and Leo rising at 10,500 BC, 10,700 BC, and and that constellation being there. All, all of that makes a lot of sense. But the entrance being on the north and the grand gallery with that orientation, I've never heard it represented this way. And I, I want to thank you for that. Even though you've really messed up my mindset. Um, if, 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 you, if you look at old churches, you will see that their graveyards are facing north and they used to bury the criminals the ones who had opposed the church you know the ones who've been decommissioned uh, they used to put it in the north because the north basically represents the accommodating womb and it is through the the the, the womb when, when you see the likes of donald trump doing his various symbols that the two thumbs together represent the return to the ether and the bottom is the womb the cosmic womb so we return to the cosmic womb from whence we came but we come from a physical womb in order to experience this world but when we cease to exist in this physical form it is deemed that we go back through you know the belly of the whale is, is another biblical story that's talking about the same thing jonah in the belly of the whale you are the soul is navigating its way back to the cosmic womb and that is north i always thought it was because jonah was abducted by aliens and that was the mothership but that's a whole nother show it's a whole nother yeah. show, michael we'll, we'll get into that symbolism um but that's a good segue back to god and i want to thank you for tossing me the ball is this representation universal is it the same on the planets in Trappist One, Zeta Reticuli, Andromeda, um, other galaxies? Uh, throughout, and it doesn't matter what part of the universe. Um, if there is uh, some kind of divine spiritual creator, is it universal that we are seeing represented here? Yes, because the, the, the Lord of the Great Pyramid has encrypted within it universal law. <clears throat> so if you look at a universal language that everyone can speak, it's mathematics. And that is why you have the likes of NASA sending mathematical equations and different things up into the skies, because they know that everybody speaks mathematics or they, they are aware of, of the mathematics of the universe. So if you speak in mathematical terms then you're able to communicate with pretty much anybody anywhere 
So it is a universal law, but like any other law, some people drop out of the system. Some people do not understand the law. Some people don't care about the law. And humanity has pretty much become out of tune. And we are at a low octave compared to where we should be. The creator is seen in cycles. The motion of the creator is the cycle. So when early man used to watch the cycles of the stars, through watching the cycles of the stars, he was able to understand the cycles of himself and the cycles of nature. And that is witnessing the motion of God in the cycles. Within those cycles, you have various laws. You know, you have the third dimensional law of physics. You'll have a fourth dimensional law of physics. And each dimension will correspond to a different law of physics and different mathematics. But if you speak this higher language, you'd be able to speak to anybody anywhere. When, when, when ET does the big reveal here, right? Mm -hmm. It's going to happen eventually. And I'm not talking about what you've seen and what I've seen. I'm talking about the big one. When that goes down, uh, my fear is that E.T. is going to come off of that craft and say, eh, we gave up on math a long time ago. We've moved on. We now do things, blah, blah, blah. I don't know what that answer is, but I think that's the fear because physicists and, and others, you know, like Carl Sagan, right? It's, um, it's the radio frequency of hydrogen is, is where we, you know, it, do we hear these things that they have to uh, understand what hydrogen is or whatever carbon on the other side of the universe. It's all the same thing. Therefore math is going to be the fundamental communication tool like in the movie contact, right? Okay. But what if it's not, what if it's, what if what if it's consciousness and colors, right? I, you know that they moved on from it. It's like a fear yeah. we're, we're not going to be able to communicate. Well, I mean, color, color in itself is still a frequency, and even though you, you know you may well have moved on from a certain level of mathematics, you still understand the different levels of mathematics. If, if I were to go back to my if I were to go back to my high school now and sit in a, in a maths class, even though I've progressed from high school, I would still understand the mathematics that's been used in high school, even though the, my understanding of mathematics is far greater than it was when I was at high school itself. So you can still speak the language. You can still communicate through numbers, through frequency, through telepathy. You can still speak through verbalization which is again is a sound it is a vibration so these beings who, who the, the positive ones I, I argue are advanced spiritual humans and that is what your positive ETs are so they come back to high school they would still understand the lessons of high school even though they progress to university and beyond <clears throat> so it is still a platform for us to communicate you know, when you see Klaus and Kant of the third kind and you, you see them doing this at the end of the film, that is the Solfeggio scale. <clears throat> and, and so, again, you are communicating through music and through frequency by hand symbols. Right. We, we can do it in, in multiple ways. You know, the, these, these beings have always been here. The, you know, I, I would even suggest that some of them were here before we were because we're not from this planet. We are, we are all starseeds. Mm -hmm. Our genetics are programmed in the cosmos. Our physical body is a result of an exploding star in the Orion Nebula. We are not from Earth. <clears throat> so we are all star seeds. So who came first, them or us? We will always have. It has to be the same everywhere. When um, uh, the, uh, the Japanese uh, 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 probe that just came back from the asteroid, and there we got a second one coming back too from Bena. That'll be uh, here, Hayabusa two. That'll be here in September. What they found it's incredible. I mean, I, I think this is like the biggest news in human history so far. That they've got 
uh, all the fundamental basic sugars, and uh, they even got it's just, uh, 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 anyway of of RNA. So and and it, and of course that's the communication tool for DNA. Without RNA, there is no DNA. Without no DNA, there is no us. And this is flying around the universe on asteroids, right? It's, it's like the most insane thing that we could possibly think of, and it survives the vacuum of space. I think that's remarkable. You see, space is not empty. Space is full. Space is teamed with life on different frequencies. When I, I, I was just sitting there one day and I had an idea. Look at an aerial view of the Giza Plateau and draw lines where the pyramids are, where the nine pyramids are in groups of three. And when I did that, I came up with this shape of lines. And when I looked into the mathematical meaning of those lines, it related to 345, which is the hypotenuse triangle. Now you see this hypotenuse triangle all over the world in sacred sites. So if you're looking down at the Giza Plateau from above and you had the same idea as I did to connect the pyramids as if they were dots with a line, you are being spoken to mathematically. Now these were absolutely advanced, super advanced race of people. And they were still speaking in hypotenuse triangles what about okay, okay, and this is where um, I, I've got to call you on one thing. Okay, this, this is where because I don't understand it either, right? But when we look at the alignment of Orion and Robert Paval and his excellent work, and Graham Hancock and Randall Carlson and John Anthony White, and others, right? Um, the shafts at the Great Pyramid, if you turn back the celestial clock and look at the star alignments at certain times, those shafts are pointing at stars. Now, there are some Egyptologists that will say those are air shafts. Well, I don't know why they would be air shafts, but nonetheless, um, they don't want some advanced technical feature to be there because it's going to suggest something else. And if those alignments are during those time periods, then it throws off the dating of the pyramids given to us by Orthodox Egyptologists, right? 2650 BC, right? And these alignments are at 11,000 BC, 10,700 BC. Um, and it could also suggest 26,000 years before that too as well. You mentioned... 73,000 years and some change today. What were those shafts for? Were they for an alignment at 10,700 BC as per Robert Baval and others? Uh, were they a celestial alignment or were, were these for other things? Because you are suggesting a sonic vibrational sound connection with this. But clearly, they may be there for other reasons. So was the alignment of the Great Pyramid a celestial thing, or was it for something else? When, when you look at the, the, the layout of the three large pyramids of Giza, yes, they do resemble Orion. And Orion is highly significant in relation to the Duet, which is the underworld of Egypt, Sirius and Orion. Osiris, Isis. Okay. But it also, when you look at the Jupiter Saturn conjunction, the great conjunction, which happens in Pisces, which forms your star of Bethlehem. So a, a Jupiter Saturn conjunction in Pisces also gives you the same layout when you impose, superimpose, I think, three individual conjunctions. It gives you the layout of the three great periods as well. So it's not only Orion, but it's also a Jupiter Saturn great conjunction that also is replicated in the layout of the pyramids. In order to become a high priest, 
you had to know the motions of the stars. You had to align yourself to star energies. The shafts were how the star energies went into the Great Pyramid, where the priest would be waiting for the star energies of alignment. The only way you can become a high priest is if you understand the motion of the stars and align yourself to star energies. One of the reasons that Rome changed our calendar was to mess us up and confuse us in relation to alignments to st certain stars at certain times of the year. It is a jealously guarded secret. So in order to know where certain stars were at certain times, you basically had to have an observatory to know where things were. And that is another face of, of a very large kind of these monoliths and monuments. They were observatories, but they were initiations places, but you had to understand the motion of the stars and you had to align yourself to the energy of certain stars at certain times. When you start looking at Draco, it also brings you into the lost city of Atlantis. Draco being dragon, being serpent. When you have a procession of the equinox, which is 25,920 years, that is separated by four divisions, 6,480 years each. They are the four fixed signs of the zodiac. But within that 25,920 years of a procession of the equinox, which is the biblical judgment day at the end of that, you have seven changes of the pole star. One of those pole stars is Draco. Now, when the pole star changes from Draco, it falls from grace. It is the serpent falling from heaven in the Bible. So these seven different pole stars are the seven islands of Atlantis. Now, when a pole star changes from one to the other, the previous one is said to sink in the celestial waters. So after the seventh one has sunk, you have lost the, uh, the, the city of Atlantis, the lost city of Atlantis. It is in the sky, as is Noah's Ark. The Ark, planet Nibiru, is not a planet. It is the Ark of Heaven, which is 360 degrees. Now, how do you write a big circle in Sumerian? 3,600. What is 3,600? The orbit of planet X. It is not a planet. They are mapping the stars. When you look at the ancient handbags and the ancient depictions of serpents of the Anunnaki. Okay, Anunnaki, here, we here we go. Here we go. Tell the, me. The, talk. Anun the, the, the Anunnaki, An Anunnaki, Anakin, comes from Anak, which is long neck. They're talking about serpent man who has risen, his serpent within him, his Christ within him. When you look at the Bible saying... What about the purses? No, the purses, you can't... The, the, the purses, the handle is the Ark of Heaven, and the purse is basically symbolic of containing the knowledge of creation within the Ark of Heaven. That, 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 that is the, the, the handbags of the ancient world. That is also used by the Royal Ark of Freemasonry, the handbag in the Ark. So it's the Ark of Heaven, the Noah's Ark of Heaven. So when you look at the, the, the Bible and Genesis and creation, a mighty wind swept over the waters, Enlil and Enki. It's talking about creation in Genesis. <clears throat> the Anunnaki story is talking about the serpent, the man who has attained wisdom, who's become the Christ, the Osiris. That is what the Anunnaki story is about. It is a metaphor, as is the Bible, as is the Quran as is all of these famous holy writs, they are all talking about man's transition to enlightenment from his condition to his potential. So the Anunnaki is talking about creation and man's potential. The handbag is the Ark of Heaven. Within that Ark of Heaven, you have the blueprint for creation. That is the Anunnaki story. Nibiru is the heavens. It is not a planet. Man, that's heavy. That's heavy. Uh, well, it, 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 Zachariah Sitchin, and to his credit, there's many different universities that have come to the same conclusion, having translated the Sumerian scrolls. The problem is they're not translating it 
from the correct perspective. If I was to pass them a Bible and say, translate the Bible, you would get Noah was 120 when he built a wooden ark, this, that and the other. They're doing a literal translation, translation, sorry. They are not looking at the deeper spiritual meaning. When you look at the deeper spiritual meaning, you bypass the superficial story. When you bypass the superficial story, you realize that it is a metaphor that is containing a deeper secret. That deeper secret is how the hell we get out of there. Hmm. That's what we're all saying in different ways. So the Anunnaki, the Sumerian scrolls have been misinterpreted. They've been mistranslated, as has the Bible, as, as the Great Pyramid, as a Stonehenge, as is the Pyramid of the Sun to Yohannikan, as is Quetzalcoatl, as is America, Amruka, the plumed serpent. When the Kundalini energy rises, not only does it dissolve into light, so therefore the Supreme Light wishes to recover its particles, but when this Kundalini serpent energy within rises, it is symbolized by a plumed feathered serpent. That is what America means. It is talking about those who have risen the serpent within them. The snake men are those who have risen the serpent within them. That is the Anunnaki long neck Anak, the serpent man. I cannot wait to get you back on the show. I I, I, could, I could do this for about two, three more hours. I'm not going to do that to you tonight, but I am going to ask you, uh, where can everybody get your books? The best place really is, is the website, uh, which is michael-feely.com. Uh, the reason I say that is there's lots of information on there. There's lots of video interviews. There's lots of blogs. There's lots of articles. There's lots of buttons to connect you to various social media sites that I'm on. So that's probably the best place to go. And then that leads to everywhere else. All right. I'm popping that up in the chat and I'm going to let the moderators know to go ahead and uh, repost that. We've got uh, Michael's website up over on our website in the notes below and throughout social media. Michael, I'll see you in a couple of months over in the UK. Uh, I'm excited to get you back on the show and we can continue this conversation. Much, much to learn from you, my friend. Thank you so much. And and thank you for, you know, staying up uh, so early in the morning, late in the day, or early in the however you want to look at it over in the UK. Great conversation tonight, man. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure. And anytime. Thank you. Michael Feely. And again, live from the UK. Thank you, Michael. Michael's links are below social media and over on our website. Great, great conversation tonight. And uh, that's it. So I am headed out of town. I will be, uh, I'll be on a cruise for the next seven days. I'll see everybody when I get back, but also I will be live streaming from the ship. So don't worry. You're going to get your Jimmy fix on. It's all good. Fade to Black is produced by Hill J. Palm, Renee, Dennis, and Kevin. Webmasters, Drew the Geek, Music, Doug Aldrich. Intro, Space Boy, spaceboymusic.com. Fade to Black is produced by KJC Ever, the Game Changer Network, and this broadcast is owned and copyrighted. 2023 by Fade to Black and the Game Changer Network, Inc. It cannot be rebroadcast, downloaded, copied, or used anywhere in the known universe without written permission from Fade to Black and the Game Changer Network. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. I want to thank Michelle Freed. You're the best. Until, man, it's going to be, what, 17th? All right? But I'll be hanging out with you online over the next seven days. But until the next one, I want you to be safe. Go back, Lee Tappy.